This episode, I'm joined by Matt Segal, who is Assistant Professor in the Philosophy, Cosmology and Consciousness Program at California Institute of Integral Studies. In this episode, we discuss his book, Physics of the World's Soul, Whitehead's Adventure in Cosmology, alongside discussions on the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead, Schelling, Process Theology and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Omitics and gain access to some exclusive content, then please find links in the description below. It's very much appreciated. Enjoy. So, Matt Segal, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics podcast. My pleasure, James. Good to be here. Uh, we are going to be discussing your book, Physics of the World Soul, Whitehead's Adventure in Cosmology, which is published by Sacrosage. Um, so this is a book, as you'd imagine, about Alfred North, uh, Alfred North Whitehead's sort of cosmology and your own reading of this and a book specifically on this, uh, which delves into a lot of uh, really interesting influences on Whitehead and just a lot of... Um, I don't know, sort of areas of philosophy that seem to be not so much rarely touched on, but rarely combined uh, in this interesting way. So, um, yeah, thanks for coming on. And um, before we begin, just tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. Um, what it is you do and how you came to, to write this book? Yeah, um, so I'm a uh, philosophy professor. I teach uh, process philosophy, Whitehead's work, uh, but also other thinkers in a process lineage that we could go into. Um, and I teach at the California Institute of Integral Studies, which is in uh, San Francisco. We, uh, although during the pandemic, we've kind of virtualized everything. And so we are uh, truly planetary. Um, I teach predominantly online um, in a, uh, both master's and PhD level programs and kind of um, in that way, building on uh, sort of philosophizing, I guess, public philosophizing that I've been doing on YouTube for uh, almost 15 years now, I think. Um, and so, you know, while I do teach professionally, I also consider philosophy to be something that's essential to um, just, uh, you know, public dialogue and uh, creating an intellectual culture. And so um, it's not something that I would stop doing if they stopped paying me to do it. It's more of a way of life for me. Um, philosophy is, yeah, uh, traditionally it's the love of wisdom. And so for me, I really do engage that um, as a spiritual practice because uh, it's a source of meaning for me in my life, right? So it's not just my profession. Um, it's also that, but um, I think that, makes my approach to philosophy a bit different than most academics perhaps. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Cool. Okay. And uh, so this, this book really arose out of your, your interest in Whitehead and process philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this book, physics of the world soul, it actually originated as uh, what's called a comprehensive exam when I was doing my doctoral work. So before you start writing your dissertation, you have to demonstrate mastery of <clears throat> specific areas of research. And so I wrote on Whitehead, um, trying to introduce his thought, but also in this book, um, I'm applying Whitehead's ideas to contemporary science, um, physics and relativity theory, uh, uh, quantum physics and relativity theory, as well as evolutionary theory and uh, complex systems theory. And so I really wanted to demonstrate the continued relevance of, of Whitehead's perspective, um, even in the midst of, um, you know, a, a century later of, of, of scientific development. I think Whitehead's ideas have only become more adequate as the sort of metaphysical background for um you know, integrating all the special sciences. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, uh, because Whitehead is a truly integral thinker who's trying to bring science and religion uh, into a more fruitful kind of dialogue with each other, I also do some theology in this book. Um, and I would call it a naturalistic theology. It's, a, it's an understanding of the divine as imminent in the universe 
and as the universe as um, yes, purposeful, but not designed from outside um, with a, you know, that's, there's a sort of typical deistic or just theistic view of God as a sort of engineer that stands outside and above the universe and has created the universe as some sort of a perfect clockwork um, and then inserted human souls inside of this machine. That's not Whitehead's view. And that's not the sort of theology I do. Um, I refer to it more as, uh, well, the term endotheology, which means a sort of theology from within. Uh, we are within the divine, the divine is within the universe. And so when we theologize, um, we're really, uh, I would say, trying to articulate um, the most ultimate context uh, that we are capable of grasping. Um, so it's a short book, but I, I do try to, to connect um, some pretty uh, important dots throughout this text. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things I was gonna, going to mention is it's a short book, but it... Um it's pleasantly not so much dense as you wouldn't expect so much in such a short amount of time. It's sort of uh, quite impressive. Um, but I'm sure, you know, we'll get into the book, we'll get into what's happening in Physics of the World Soul. But before we do so, um, I have to ask you the Hermitics question. Um, you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? And as your book is primarily centered around Whitehead, we can include Whitehead and add three more. <laughs> okay so whitehead's there um i would say gosh it's hard to, to decide between socrates and plato um i'll say whitehead socrates uh, friedrich schelling and um william james uh yeah should i should i say a bit about why or should yeah, i yeah no Whitehead? no no so i'm just trying to like connect trying to figure out whether or not there's a clear what the clear current between them is i mean there would be a lot of talking the the there isn't too many people there who well there's no one there i can see who's reserved in character <laughs> yeah it would be a dynamic uh discussion no doubt about it um you know socrates is there because i think he would test the wisdom of the other figures um, quite thoroughly. And by the end of it, we would know for sure whether um, any of their ideas, you know, held water. Um, and James is an important influence on Whitehead. And I think an important check on the idealist um, tendencies of Schelling. Uh, and so in a way I'm, I'm imagining this dialogue because um, it's sort of the, debate that goes on within my own, my own head. Um, you know, I, I, I also teach German idealism and Schelling is my favorite, uh, of those, uh, figures from that period of philosophy. And, um, so there's that idealist side of, of my thinking. And yet, you know, Whitehead and James, I think are both, um, they refer to themselves as empiricists, as realists and there's, and pragmatists, um, and so I, I also have that desire to remain sort of um, earthly and uh, practical in my engagement with the realm of ideas. And so it would be really helpful for me to be able to just take in an exchange. Probably there'd be some debate between these figures um, just to see how it shakes out. Uh, it might help me bring more harmony to these sometimes discordant aspects of, you know, my own inner uh, philosophic life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is there a conversation that you'd like them to gravitate towards? Or do you think it would be primarily this sort of question of getting to the kernel of truth within each of their thoughts sort of targeted from Socrates, you know, and really, instead of a, a conversation between them, which they all gravitate towards, it's more of a perhaps a bit more um, antagonistic. Yeah. I mean, I would hope that the antagonism, though it might be there initially, would not be where they ended up. Um, in some ways, my book is um, a dialogue between these thinkers. Um, Socrates, I don't think, is cited in the text. Of course, I cite Plato. Um, but I think the importance of Socrates here is uh, for the oral tradition of philosophy, that philosophy is really about dialogue originally. Um, and, you know, this is a written text, all these other figures except Socrates certainly wrote 
a lot of very influential um, philosophical texts. Uh, but if the point is to have a dialogue, I think Socrates is, is an important ingredient. But, you know, I try to show in my book how Whitehead and Schelling are um, in a lineage with one another, a uh, process uh, philosophical lineage um, where, you know, reality is understood primarily as a sort of dynamic becoming and an evolutionary um, unfolding. And so I suspect that while they may disagree on first principles, say, um, at the end of the day, they are going to be um, able to inhabit a very similar universe uh, and, and accept a very similar, um, you know, form of like science and, and what, what, what natural science is and how it should operate. Um, and I think, you know, James, of course, as I mentioned, an important influence on Whitehead, who's in a, in a actually rather Kantian way, really emphasizing practice, uh, emphasizing the pragmatic, obviously, and the sort of ethical um, relevance and the, the sort of actionable um, aspect of our ideas. And ultimately for a pragmatist, if it's not actionable, if an idea uh, cannot be um, shown to be some in some way relevant to our um, everyday experience and and practice, then it's it's a false idea. You know, that's kind of the pragmatist um, uh, MO. So yeah, I think they would um, hopefully balance out each other nicely and 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 uh, issue forth um, a really coherent and helpful practical philosophy. Are, are you? personally sympathetic to the pragmatist um worldview uh yeah i think pragmatism we we need to unpack exactly what we mean because i think you know in the context of american philosophy and the reception history of you know charles saunders purse and william james's philosophies and, and john dewey's as well um particularly as it got sort of filtered through richard rorty um i think it became something else something more postmodern and, and ironic and ultimately way less helpful than the, than the original uh, sources were. And so I'm not a, I'm not a Rordian pragmatist. I'm, I'm a Persian or Jamesian or Deweyan pragmatist. Uh, but yeah, I certainly align with that, that school of thought. Okay. Okay. Um, it's interesting that you bring Schelling in to the room because this is where you begin your book. You begin with uh with with making it clear that there is this, um, as you say, overlooked relationship between Schelling and Whitehead, with Whitehead sort of inheriting this, uh, uh, I'll probably mispronounce this, but, you know, natto philosophy, uh, which which leads into sort of this idea of thinking organically. Um, but really this, would you say that this this um, philosophical inheritance from, from Schelling to Whitehead begins with what you've already been speaking about in that idealist tradition of being able to get beyond the sort of stereotypically Kantian subject object division and Whitehead finds a severance here, but it, this begins with Schelling, this, this possibility to get beyond this. Sorry, I've thrown a lot in there. So, so it, but there's this, the, the place of primary importance for Schelling is this beginning to look at the subject object division differently. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Schelling is is a certainly a uh, inheritor of Kant, but a creative inheritor in the sense that, um, in some ways, Schelling is a, he's accepting the transcendental critique of the old mode of of doing metaphysics, the so called dogmatic uh, school, um, and so Schelling recognizes that we need to surface the conditions of possibility of our own thinking, but. I would say what Schelling does to Kant is um, he almost out transcendentalizes Kant, which is to say he shows how Kant still had some dogmatic presuppositions. Um, one of them was this sort of yeah, subject object division, or we might say the, the, the division between um, the, um, the mind and uh, reality. And so for Schelling and, and all the absolute idealists, um, the, the goal of philosophy is to achieve the absolute, which would be the canceling of the difference between subject and object or between knower and known, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, a, a unity of what in Kant's philosophy remains um, separated. And uh, Schelling throughout his career has various 
deploys various methods to try to achieve the absolute. Sometimes it's using concepts, sometimes it's using art, other times it's religion and mysticism. Um, you know, sometimes it's, uh, you know, sort of uh, through um, you know, ruminating on, on the history of, of, of the world as he does in his unpublished uh, text, Ages of the World. Um, later it's mythology. Um, and so Schelling didn't ever settle on sort of the one right way to do philosophy um, or the one correct and true system. He's sort of different from Hegel in this respect. Um, and you could say that this is, you know, one reason that uh, Schelling's philosophy is inferior to like someone like Hegel, who seems to have actually more or less completed a system, an encyclopedic, you know, rendering of all the knowledge that human beings have, and also the, the sort of logical preconditions of that knowledge. And, um, and Hegel certainly criticized Schelling, but on the other hand, as Peirce, you know, the American philosopher later put it in a letter to William James about Schelling, he thought that Schelling's uh, approach to philosophy as fluid and protein as it was, was actually more scientific and experimental, uh, which is a, something that Peirce valued. Um, so Schelling wasn't ever stuck in a rut. Um, and so Whitehead inherits this sense of philosophy as um, one way or another, uh, an expression of something that is intrinsic to uh, the unfolding of the universe itself. Uh, in other words, as Schelling put it, we are nature itself philosophizing. And so this is, again, a, a way of um, getting at the cancellation of the subject-object division, mm -hmm. such that what we usually conceive of as something just objective, as a collection of objects, nature, is actually itself um, the source of our own subjectivity, and in that sense, already subjective, even if in its in organic forms and its pre-human forms, it's not quite as um, intense in its subjectivity and its in its capacity to imagine possible futures and then take action to realize those futures in the present. You know, these are things that um, I think gradually develop in the course of evolution, and human consciousness is in this way an especially intense um, expression of the plasticity of nature. You might say. Um, you know, nature's ability to reform itself. Mm -hmm. And so rather than seeing human consciousness as some kind of anomaly in the universe, uh, Whitehead inheriting Schelling understands consciousness rather as the most intense example of, uh, or expression of the essence of the universe. Mm -hmm. So this is almost the, the primary problem for Whitehead in terms of a cosmology is that as soon as you, uh, differentiate consciousness from the nature which apparently it is within if you say it's within you're immediately causing a separation so immediately we sort of enter into a problem of language because it's extremely difficult to talk about these things because basically the entirety of the history of philosophy i mean there's obviously thinkers who haven't uh perhaps lucretius would be one of the earliest um but the the history of philosophy is this this sort of almost hierarchical separation where there's an implicit idea that because of our, as you say, uh, supposed anomaly position of our consciousness in nature, that sort of comes across as above or better, whereas Whitehead begins in saying that it's uh, just an intense form of that very same nature that we are, we are not within, but we are of. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Whitehead wouldn't deny that we are within the universe. I mean, it's kind of hard to avoid this common sense way of speaking, but he'd also say the universe is within each of us. Mm -hmm. And so there's sort of this holographic um, or fractal uh, topology to, to his conception of the cosmos. Um, and so, yes, we are obviously within the universe, but that's not the whole story. Uh, we also have to invert that. And, you know, so there are certain implications that follow from this um, this complex inversion whereby we're, we are both within the universe and the universe is within us um, you know we can we can unpack that uh, as we move forward but <clears throat> it's important to keep both sides of that equation in mind mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I mean the biggest leap he's making is getting a, getting beyond the epistemical uh, epistemological problems of Kant right that uh, phenomena, noumena, divide or split um, and the problem of splitting in general in the sense of uh, K 
Kant's problem of saying, well, it's not that we don't know the new mena, it's that we can never know either way. It could be as it appears, the representation could be as it appears, but it also might not be. But the point is, because of our uh, sensible faculties, we will never know this. Whereas, so the importance of Whitehead's cosmology here then in getting a, beyond this epistemological problems of, of, of Kant's system and the German idealist system, um, excluding a few thinkers where they vary off in different directions, is saying that the the very process of synthesis from sensibility is itself sort of of what it is we're trying to figure out or trying to know so how does he manage how, how does he manage to bridge that gap well i think as whitehead himself um articulates this and this his response to kant is that first of all he's critiquing um kant's conception of the the aesthetic domain and, and the, the transcendental aesthetic as it's um, titled in the critique of pure reason. Whitehead says that that section of, of the first critique should actually, rather than being like 20 pages in the Cambridge edition should actually be the whole book. Mm -hmm. um, and Whitehead says his own uh, process philosophy is um, an attempt to replace the Kantian critique of pure reason with a critique of pure feeling. And so for Whitehead aesthetics becomes first philosophy and mm -hmm. epistemology and ontology are sort of subsets of aesthetics as is morality. Um, and so in other words, knowledge is an especially complex form of feeling for mm -hmm. Whitehead. And so, but he, he, he doesn't accept the um, it's, you know, Hume actually is, is one who gives more um, sort of articulated defense of this view, but Kant inherits it from Hume, which is the, the idea that the most primitive form of experience that, that human beings um, engage with is sense experience. In other words, um, the data that comes through our outward facing senses, our visual, our auditory uh, experience, um, our sensory perception through those organs most predominantly. I mean, visual experience is, I think, the, the, the dominant source of um, you know, epistemological significance in the history of philosophy. And Whitehead thinks that philosophers have paid too much attention to their visual experience and not enough attention to their visceral experience. And so for Whitehead, it's, it's the feelings of the viscera and what he calls, rather than sense perception, bodily reception. This is the most primitive form of experience for Whitehead. And rather than Kant having to respond to Hume in an attempt to save causality by making causality uh, a category of our understanding that's imposed on experience necessarily and universally, Whitehead says, wait a minute, um, he, he doesn't accept Hume's claim that we don't have experience of causality. We experience it in each moment of our bodily life. Mm -hmm. um, and he even points out in Hume's own texts how Hume is presupposing our direct experience of causality um you know when you when you pull back the shade and the light pours onto your face you blink <laughs> why do you blink because there's a causal influence uh mm -hmm. coming in from your environment and we experience that um before there is an a, the appearance of a visual field out there when and whereby causality kind of recedes into the background the immediate sensation of being blinded by the light that, and, and recognizing that, oh, we see with our eyes, as Hume himself says, that is causality. And we are directly, it couldn't be a more direct experience of causality in Whitehead's view. And so um, he doesn't have to go through all the complex Kantian machinery to save causation. He says we actually have a bodily felt sense of what that is. And he gives brilliant examples of Hume defending this very view without realizing it. Um, and so this is, you know, Whitehead amends the, not just Kantian, but it's a predominant view in, in modern Western philosophy of mere sensation as uh, the most primordial form of experience. Whitehead says that's actually secondary, more primordial is the experience of what he calls, he calls causal efficacy or our bodily reception of these um, vectors of 
of, of feeling and emotion that kind of stream into us from our environment. And so uh, these are the feelings of the viscera, right? Mm -hmm. And after this kind of, um, you know, amendment of our understanding of what's actually primordial in our, in our experience, um, there really is, there's still a gap between appearance and reality, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not a sort of um, epistemological division as Kant had it. Um, it's more like a, um, there's a, there's a blurry boundary here. And to some extent we can in a vague way, at least, um, feel embedded within a real environment. And we can, again, at least in a vague way, know that each moment of our experience is inheriting the patterns of that environment. And so, you know, it's not that Whitehead's just totally erasing this Kantian distinction. Uh, he's just giving it, he's, he's rendering it in a, in a fresh way um, so that it becomes, you know, more or less a, a kind of heuristic, but not a epistemological rule by which we're always forbidden from knowing um, the real world out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm glad that there's one thing you brought up there just to sort of quick, quick digression where I remember reading it and thinking, well, I've never agreed with someone so much in terms of the critique of pure reason, which is when I, when I, I did seven lectures on the critique of pure reason. And in each one, once I'd done the second one, which was on transcendental aesthetic, I emphasized Look, in my personal opinion, which obviously Whitehead came to first, which is if you really want to understand this book, just get to grips with the transcendental aesthetic. It's the it's that's the point which you if you grasp that, everything will fall into place. But then, you know, is as Whitehead points out, this the aesthetic is really early on, it's really short, it's to be honest, quite clear. And then after that you're you are left sort of thinking, I don't know why you're adding all this stuff in when you've just you know, you've just written this amazing you know, thing, and now you're you're going into these really nitty gritty, almost needless uh, complexities without really dealing with the meat of, you know, the thing that's just, which is amazing. So I can completely sympathise with Whitehead on that. Um, but I um, mean, when you 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 spoke at the be the beginning that you're bringing in um, quantum physics into this. Now I'm not going to try go into quantum physics. I'm not an expert at all. But one thing I do understand, and completely correct me if my wrong. Uh, if I'm wrong, is this acceptance within quantum quantum f physics? Once again, correct me if I'm wrong. That the in terms of perception, the the act of perceiving can alter that which is perceived in the sense that there is a once you have that relationship, then something else is happening. And in the sense of Whitehead, in this in this way of altering um, the the putting aesthetics first, in the sense of a critique of pure feeling the subjective processes of the subject for whitehead are these potential clear alterations of what it is they would then perceive they can completely get in the way and alter reality yeah so sorry with, i dumped a lot no no that's fine i'm i think it's an important question and you you articulated it clearly enough um the problem with quantum physics is not even the quantum physicists understand it. Uh, I mean, they know the, they know the math mm. and they, they, they can make predictions and we can design microchips, microprocessors based on those predictions. But what does it mean? How are we to interpret this? Um, I think there are at least a dozen, if not more, interpretations of quantum theory. Um, it's very frustrating for me as a philosopher because when I want to look at what um, the special sciences are doing and, and learn what the state of the art is. When you get into quantum theory, yes, there's a sort of instrumental um, um, understanding. That is to say, uh, there's a, a sense of know-how and um, uh, a recognition of how these things can apply and, and the experiments are, are there for everyone to, to, to analyze and understand at least what happens, if not how it happens. Um, but when it comes to, yeah, the, the philosophical, the ontological interpretation, there's no consensus among the scientists. And so this puts philosophers in, in the awkward, you know, situation, the awkward position um, of having to, you know, try to move the ball forward without much um, in the way of uh, assistance from, from the scientists. Um, but what Whitehead allows us to see is, again, if the subject-object division is 
relativized in a way, and it's it's not as um, sharply put in Whitehead, though he still has a use for these terms. Um, then it, it it heads us off at the pass, which leads to any kind of quantum mysticism, whereby, as it's often put, consciousness collapses the wave function and reality independent of consciousness exists in this sort of smeared out probability wave. And it's only when a human observer comes and makes a measurement or, or just looks uh, that that probability cloud collapses into something definite, something physical as we normally think of it. That to me is um, a confused interpretation that's based on bad philosophy, which is this old subject object division. Mm -hmm. In Whitehead's scheme, you don't need a conscious human observer to collapse the wave function because uh, nature is already observing itself at every scale, right? He's a, he's a pan experientialist. And so there is something it's like to be a photon. There's something it's like to be an electron, an atom. Um, it's not that rocks are conscious. That's not a fair um, sort of, you know, um, reduction to absurdity of Whitehead's view. He wants to distinguish between units or holes or true individuals uh, in nature and aggregates. A rock is an aggregate. It could be that the molecules, which have some degree of internal coherence and stability as a molecule, they have a vibratory signature and the atoms, which compose those molecules, there's a degree of individuality here that's not present in a rock. Um, but when you conceive of nature in this way as basically made of um, perspectives and they're perspectives that are processes, they arise and perish. You can see how the wave function is a description of an experiential process whereby um, each new perspective that arises initially is, yeah, like a cloud of probability that is inheriting an actualized past and then trying to see what can happen next, mm -hmm. right? And in each of these moments, Whitehead calls them actual occasions, mm -hmm. actual occasions of experience. Um, there's an inheritance of an actualized past and then the opening up of a kind of wave function, mm -hmm. which considers all the possibilities that could be realized in the next moment. And then there's a gradual aesthetic process whereby um, you know, the, the real potentiality of the past um, collapses upon uh, um, um, and 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 actualizes into a, a definite decision, which is the subjective perspective that's realized mm -hmm. by that occasion. But as soon as it's realized, it perishes and itself becomes an object. And then the next actual occasion of experience inherits it and has to harmonize that that uh, the potentiality of the past into a you know a new aesthetic. Um, uh, achievement that that realizes a subjective perspective. And so the reality is made of these little processes that are inheriting the past, exploring the possibilities to be realized in the next moment, making a decision, and then and then adding themselves to the sort of accumulation of the universe um, as it creatively advances. And so quantum theory um, in Whitehead's interpretation is is not that reality itself is just this fuzzy, um, indeterminate um, field of infinite potential prior to consciousness observing it. It's that there are, it's more like um, there are um, observations going on at every scale and decisions being made at every scale about how to um, bring what's actualized and what's potential into um, some finite realization. You know, so um, I think it's one of the most helpful and coherent renderings of quantum theory that allows us to connect the quantum realm to the so-called classical realm. And we can see how there doesn't need to be any crazy paradoxes or weirdness here. It's just that potentiality is, is part of the physical universe is I think the ultimate lesson of quantum physics from a Whiteheadian perspective. Mm. So what for, for, for Whitehead, what are the, um, you know, you have this, mixture of actualization and potentiality and it's in this subjective uh feeling of what their potential potentiality in relation to that actualization can be that there is then a a future you know i guess in in very very roughly that would be this the in quotation marks the subjects um feeling apprehension of that actual thing and that alters it into something else what 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 for whitehead is uh, uh, is the actualization actual the actual without 
uh, a conscious subject to do anything with it? Is it just matter or? Well, if we were going to continue to use the terms mind and matter hmm. in Whitehead's scheme, we'd need to really um, alter their definitions. But I think we can say that for Whitehead, matter is the actualized past. So it's, mm -hmm. in other words, um, the, the perished experience of subjects that have now kind of fossilized into objects. Mm -hmm. That's matter. Um, mind, then, is, uh, is what has yet to become, what remains potential. Um, matter, matter is the actualized past, and mind is the anticipated future. And mind and matter, in this way, are always meeting in the present, where actual experience is, is occurring. Actual experience always includes, for Whitehead, a physical pole and a mental pole. And the physical pole is the inheritance of the past and the mental pole is the anticipation of the futures open to um, um, the next moment, to be realized in the next moment, given what has occurred in the past. Mm -hmm. And depending on the, the grade or complexity of the occasion of experience we're talking about, um, that realm of future possibilities can be dipped into to a deeper or shallower uh, degree. So less intense, less highly complex occasions of experience are not as, um, they can't reach as deeply into the future. Their feelings of anticipation are not as intricate, but for, for human consciousness, um, you know, we can imagine a thousand years from now, we can imagine pure potential that has nothing to do with the future, really. It's just like eternity. Um, it's, it's pure potentiality that has never occurred in the past and may never occur in the future, but nonetheless, it's possible, right? And so we consider like um, modal logic or we consider alternative universes. Um, this, is, this is a capacity that um, it seems only human beings on planet Earth are capable of, but it might be a marker of intelligent um extraterrestrials uh that this is why we sus we suspect that an intelligent species from from another planet would also have something like mathematics um and so yeah this is this is how whitehead sort of um reinterprets mind and matter um, but matter for him is not just clumps of stuff that that idea has no place in his universe anymore okay so it seems then you'd have to draw in Whitehead's sense of time, which now seems to be to be a matter of creation, of development. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, time for Whitehead is creative advance, is one phrase he uses. It is emergent evolution. Uh, it is. It is never. Uh, no two moments are the same, and every next moment includes the past moment. So, time is cumulative. Right. It's not just um, a sort of homogenous, like empty timeline that is only a record of um, motion. It is rather um, it has a qualitative dimension. Right. It's not just a quantitative timeline. Mm -hmm. The qualitative dimension is the fact that the universe is growing ever richer with each passing moment, because each moment includes everything that occurred before. And it adds something new itself mm -hmm. uh, to this creative advance. And so it's an evolutionary view of time, a view of time where the future is as yet unactualized and doesn't exist. So this is different than a kind of Einsteinian block universe where the future is sort of out there in some fourth, ultimately spatial dimension. Um, and our perception, our consciousness is sort of just this illusory pane of glass moving through this four dimensional manifold in, in the Einsteinian view. Whitehead rejects that kind of determinism and says the past and the future are ontologically distinct. They have a different kind of reality um, and that freedom is possible. Again, not libertarian freedom where I can like do, I can't grow wings and fly. Right. Mm. Um, for example, but there are other things that just don't really, at least very likely for me to be able to do in the next moment or even in my entire life. Um, so it's not total freedom, but nonetheless, we have some, um, capacity to to realize and decide upon more ideal futures um, because the future again has not happened yet and we're not strictly determined by what has already happened 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that leads me to an important question, which is, 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 is then, is there such a thing as teleology for, for Whitehead, or is that simply a matter of um, creative intensity in relation to some uh, subjective ideal? I mean, creative intensity in response to some subjective ideal is a good description of what Whitehead means by teleology. Um, I think he would not accept a sort of, um, you know, the, the sort of teleology that someone like William Paley would have defended, who was a famous theologian in uh, just the generation before Darwin, I believe, who, uh, you know, described this process of like finding a clock or a hand watch on the beach and and saying, ah, this um, clearly it has parts that were put together in some purposeful way. Mm. There must have been a designer. Um, Whitehead, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't conceive of the universe as some sort of a machine designed by a transcendent um, engineer. So that's not the sort of, it's not a um, transcendent teleology. It's more like the imminent teleology that Kant himself described in his third critique. Um, It's a natural purpose, which is a function of what Kant again called self-organization. Um, Kant, Kant's critiques got better <laughs> as, as he, you know, and, and I think his whole approach to philosophy actually changed um, by the time you get to the third critique, um, where he's, you know, looking at organisms and realizing that uh, all the categories that allow us to describe the rest of inorganic nature don't work. These mechanistic categories don't work on organisms because their cause and effect are circular. They're, they're, the, the cause and the effect are internal to one another. The parts produce each other and the whole to which they belong, the very different kind of causation than Kant or Newton saw operative in the rest of nature. Um, Schelling and Whitehead make that sort of organic purposiveness uh, cosmic rather than saying, oh, this is just unique to biological organisms. Um, It is actually something that the whole cosmos is doing. And rather than mechanism being predominant as the, the mode of causality operative throughout nature, mechanism becomes more of an appearance organism becomes the true reality that's underlying everything self-organization in other words becomes the true reality underlying everything and that's a purposiveness or a teleology that is um it's generated um internally by the the being um in question um rather than imposed on that being or upon the universe from the outside right so it's purposes that grow from within rather than being imposed from without. And in Whitehead's view, I mean, he says quite plainly that the teleology of the universe is directed at the production of beauty. Mm -hmm. That's the, if there's an ultimate aim, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, and and beauty has to do with the realization of um, more intense contrasts that are brought into harmonization. So there's uh, beauty is the maximization of diversity that can still be held into some coherent whole Mm -hmm. right and so the universe is constantly diversifying and individuating and yet doing so in a way um that produces a uh uh, it's you know the a chord you know like all these notes form a chord or um the 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 a melody is brought forth out of um the the individual um um notes or chords that are being played by the diversity of, of the universe Okay, so what what role then does God play within this sort of imminent creativity, within this this uh, self organizing cosmology, and what is God? Yeah, I mean, in this to just continue the metaphor, God's the conductor of the orchestra, mm-hmm. um, trying to lure the various you know members of the orchestra towards greater harmony and intensity. Now, just like the or- the the uh, conductor can't um, coerce and force. Uh, you know, all the, the the musicians in the orchestra to play the right note or to not go off script. Um, God can't force the creatures of the universe to, to sort of obey. Um, rather, God elicits, um, elicits beauty from the universe by, by establishing an ideal, which Whitehead calls the primordial nature of God, which is this sort of... Um, original ordering of the infinite realm of possibility to give it some tilt towards um, 
towards beauty or towards what the divine finds valuable, which is, you know, the, the, the perfect ideal that could be realized for the universe. Never is it actually fully realized, but nonetheless, it's the ideal towards which um, the universe is striving. But Whitehead's God is not actually his ultimate category. Creativity is the ultimate category in Whitehead's cosmology. God is a creature of creativity like the rest of us, but God is unique in being the primordial creature, the first creature. And as the first creature, God conditions creativity for all the subsequent subsequent creatures uh, to, to arise in, in the history of the universe. And by conditioning creativity, God sort of acts as a filter mm -hmm. um, that allows subsequent finite occasions of experience to um to be to have their experience initiated with some sense of relevant novelty mm. whitehead says and relevance um is is a sort of initial aim um that 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 whispers you know, it's like god whispering to each occasion to say like um come this way like i think you would enjoy this now the the occasions can decide to um you know realize their unique perspective on things in a way that's divergent from the divine lure or the initial aim. Um, but there's, there's, there's a higher probability that um, we will respond affirmatively to the divine persuasion that's luring us towards beauty. Mm -hmm. And it seems, you know, Whitehead would say the evidence for God is um, the extent to which our universe is a cosmos and not chaos. There's clearly a background of chaos and clearly the threat of destruction of the forms of order that have been achieved, nothing lasts forever. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there is a, given what we understand physically about entropy and thermodynamics and so on, um, there is way more order in the universe, way more organization and complexity than we would expect if this was just atoms falling in the void. Um, and I, I know, you know, the, uh, the original, you know, Greek atomists had the Kleinemann or the swerve, which sort of gave some dynamism and organization to things. And Whitehead's just saying, hey, that's that's the initial aim given by God uh, that allows for um, organization to emerge and um, amplify itself in the, in the history of the universe. So, yeah, that's that's the role that God plays. Um, a few of the other phrases Whitehead uses is God's the poet of the world. Uh, but God is also the fellow sufferer who understands, which is to say that God suffers all the, the pains and the, and the loss uh, and the suffering, um, as well as the joy. And uh, in this sense, God is a participant in the universe rather than a distant sort of observer of it. Okay. I mean, that was one question I was going to have there is, um, you know, in what sense can this cosmology be sort of brought down to the level of 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 man in the sense that he can uh, then further understand natural uh, happenings such as death, suffering, birth, etc. in in the sense of this cosmology? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that um, one of Whitehead's collaborators and, and friends, originally student um, Bertrand Russell says that he thought that Whitehead's theology was ultimately um, a response to the loss of his son in World War I, um, Eric Whitehead. He was in the Royal Air Force and he was shot down over France, I believe, uh, in uh, 1918. And Rus Russell thinks that Whitehead developed his process theology in, a, in an attempt for, um, or in a, in a search for some kind of consolation for this loss. Mm -hmm. However, there is no doctrine of personal immortality in, in Whitehead's um, mature philosophy. So I think Russell's claim is just false and has more to do with Russell's own atheism than it does with Whitehead's view. I don't think Russell understood Whitehead's philosophy at all. Um, so for Whitehead, personal immortality, like, like the, um, uh, as if the, the, the soul that we think we are while we're alive would have some afterlife when this body dies and decays. Whitehead doesn't say that that's impossible in his scheme, but he also doesn't say that it's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, he says, you know, we have to wait for the empirical evidence and we might be waiting for quite a long time. Um, I mean, we have near death experiences, but 
that can be explained in other ways. Um, so ultimately for Whitehead, personal immortality is kind of beside the point. Mm -hmm. There is another kind of immortality, which he calls objective immortality, which is just this more general account of how the, the present persists into the future. And so that, you know, if, if time is a process of accumulation um, and the universe is sort of growing with each pulsation of experience, um, each experience that realizes a new perspective on things, as it perishes, it becomes what Whitehead calls a superject, right? So a subject that's enjoying its experience, it dies, mm -hmm. but it becomes a superject that then acts as um, an influence on the future. Mm -hmm. That superject is inherited by the next moment of experience, which has to take it up and make something of it. And we purposes are realized in this way. Like our own soul is really a stream of occasions of experience. Whitehead calls these historical roots or societies of actual occasions. And from moment to moment, we're able to realize our purposes because the occasions of experience constituting the historical root of our own identity, our personality, they're all agreeing to continue to realize this purpose through the superjective nature of perished, the perished experiences of the past. And so that's a form of immortality. Whitehead calls it objective immortality, um, but it's not personal. Like we don't, in, in, I don't get to decide in this moment how subsequent moments of myself are going to inherit my own past. Mm -hmm. That's a strange thing to say, but it makes sense in Whitehead's scheme. Um, he says, no thinker thinks twice. Right. So in each moment, there is a new subject mm -hmm. intimately inheriting our own past because of the way that our organism sort of shelters a historical root of becoming. I know my own past more intimately uh, than, you know, my past mm -hmm. and vice versa. And yet there's still something that we share, which is, you know, a whole uh, history of evolution on planet Earth. Um, but yeah, in this way, immortality is a more generic notion for Whitehead and to what extent the, the stream of experiences that we call, that I call my soul will survive the death of the body. Um, we just don't know enough to say for sure. You know, uh, it seems like the body is, is essential for the maintenance of the coherence of the soul while we're alive. And so, you know, it could be that, you know, in Whitehead's scheme, one of the ways we might judge this would be to say that really advanced meditators or contemplative mystics or something, they've really strengthened the um, art of attention by which the soul um, becomes yeah, strengthened. And it could be that some of us, when we die, if we have a soul like that, maybe we, we do persist in some form and others who are, who lived a, a life that was more distracted, maybe not. I mean, this is the kind of universe that we begin to wonder about once we accept some of, some of Whitehead's, you know, basic, categories mm -hmm. okay okay um you you've been really really articulate on these questions and i feel uh we've got a good outline there so i mean is there anything you you feel is key that might bring in to to avoid any misunderstandings or anything you'd like to bring in um which you which you feel we've missed about this cosmology um only to say that you know whitehead was um very much a radical empiricist. And so while he wanted to be systematic in his philosophizing and seek coherence and consistency, he was also very much um, opposed to the idea that we could ever arrive at a finished and complete system. Um, I mean, you know, he and Russell started the Principia Mathematica in an attempt to, you know, formally ground mathematics in logic. Um, and they, more or less fail. I mean, I mean, the project was useful because it inspired analytic philosophy, you could mm -hmm. say. Um, but on the other hand, they didn't succeed at what they set out to do. And then Gödel later proved formally why they couldn't have succeeded. And Whitehead learned from that, um, that systematic philosophy is always going to need to be um, resting on a pragmatic basis, which is to say we need to always be um, open to testing this in, in the laboratory of life. And to the extent that it remains applicable and 
um, adequate to our experience, then we can continue to think in his in, in the terms of his cosmology. But I don't think he would want us to sort of inherit it dogmatically. Um, he would want us to continue to experiment and um, tinker with his system so that it remains applicable to science, to the continual evolution of our human consciousness. So, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of Whitehead's system, but not because I think he's somehow uh, arrived at the, the final word on anything. Wow. Um, whereabouts can we uh, find your book? It is, you know, it's a small press, Sacrosage, and uh, print on demand is essential to their operations. And Jeff Bezos has cornered the market there. So, yeah, it's on Amazon. <laughs> Amazon.com can find this thing. Um, yeah. Cool. What are you, uh, what are you working on at the moment? Currently, um, I'm not teaching. I don't teach over the summer and I am taking that time to collaborate with a couple of, uh, scientists. Um, one of them is named Bruce Damer. He's a, an astrobiologist who's working with a team at UC Santa Cruz, uh, on, uh, a hypothesis for the origins of life. It's the uh, hot spring uh, hypothesis for the origins of life, which is in contrast to the deep sea hydrothermal vent uh, account of the origins of life. Mm -hmm. And um, I won't go into the too much detail there, but I'm very interested in understanding um, this transition moment in the history of the universe, whereby the inorganic realm somehow bootstrapped itself into cellular organic um uh, a cellular and organic mode of being whereby it could a, a a unit of um molecules could distinguish itself from an environment repair itself if that environment harmed it in some way and reproduce itself allowing for there to be an inheritance of its own achievements mm -hmm. through a genetic code or epigenetically or through culture um, and learning which in whitehead's view is not just a human thing that culture and, and learning and the capacity for memory and, and passing memories on to subsequent generations. Sometimes this is called Baldwinian evolution, but for Whitehead, this, you know, there's that cultural dimension to natural evolution that goes all the way back. It's not just with humans and language and, and writing and stuff that you get uh, culture. Um, and so I'm working with, with Bruce Damer to sort of um, unpack the metaphysical implications of his biological um, or really abiogenesis hypothesis, which is the study of how the non-organic becomes organic. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's other projects I'm working on. Um, I'm hoping to collaborate with um, uh, Merlin Sheldrick, who is uh, a mycologist and studies um, the sort of mycelial networks of, of fungi and he uh, is very interested in Whitehead. And so we're looking to see if these mycelial networks are in any way um, an expression of Whitehead's organic vision of the cosmos and, and Whitehead's understanding of what he calls the nexus uh, that binds actual occasions of experience together. The mycelial network is sort of like a underground uh, nervous system that connects entire forests. And so um, Merlin and I are gonna try to develop a probably a start as an article a journal article that tries to connect these ideas wow. um so yeah that's, that's kind of what i'm working on presently it's two big projects and you you have a, a youtube channel as well yeah um thou art that uh, i think it's actually footnotes to plato now numeral two same as my blog and i've been doing that for yeah like almost 15 years and so there's quite a bit of content on there um many interviews and dialogues and some solo vlogs that I've done. Um, yeah, I really have utilized um, YouTube to do public philosophy, as I was saying. And I hope that, uh, you know, that project continues. Many other people are doing that on YouTube now. And um, I very much enjoy interacting with, with people there. Cool. I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll be sure to link them. Um, yeah. Matt Segal. Thanks very much. My pleasure, James. Great to talk to you.